Borida. Um, I'm Donald Forrester. I'm new to Wales. Um, I'm um, Professor of Child and Family Social Work at Cardiff University and the Director of Cascade. So for those who know Sally Holland, I'm the new Sally Holland, which may be hard to imagine. But um, I'm really nervous about um, doing this three or four minute talk. I'm not usually nervous. I've been thinking about why it is. And I guess there are, are two reasons why I'm a bit, I've been a bit nervous. One is, um, it's a bit like the first day at a new school for me. Um, so my, my kids have just moved to Wales, so I've been seeing them have their first day at new school. Um, I've been based in London and the South East and developed a lot of links with workers, managers, all, all sorts of people in, in that region. Uh, we've moved to Wales. I hope to be here for, well, forever, really. Um, and so I guess you're my new professional community. So I hope that you'll be friendly and nice to me as the children in my, um, uh, in, in my children's schools were. Um, and the second thing is, while I, tomorrow I'm doing, talking about research, and I'm kind of comfortable doing that. Today I, I want to talk to you about exchange, which is a new, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it, but it's, it's a new way of bringing together researchers, people who deliver services, and those with direct experiences with services. Um, so over breakfast, I thought, I f I, I'm feeling a bit nervous because it's a bit like Dragon's Den. I'm trying to pitch to you that you should join Exchange. But my team made a very important point, which is, unlike Dragon's Den, I'm not asking for any money from you. Um, so we're offering you a service which, in these times of limited budgets, is free. So I'm kind of hopeful that that is probably more important than anything else I'm about to say. Um, what we hope is that all the local authorities across Wales and other major... Um, players within social care and the social care workforce uh, will join up to Exchange, and I want to tell you a little bit about why that is. Um, Exchange is a network that is going to try to bring together those doing research, uh, people with expertise, who've got expertise, people who've got expertise from research, people who've got expertise from practice and leadership within children's services, and crucially, at all our events, also people with direct experience of services themselves. Um, to create ongoing conversations about how research can make practice better, but also how a detailed knowledge of practice can make research better. Um, I think there's been lots of attempts to do research dissemination within social work, social care over the years, and I think a lot of those are based on what I think is basically a deficit model, and this is the model. The model is, we researchers know things, we've found things out, you, delivering services, don't know things, so what we need to do is package up what we know and give it to you so that you use it. Um, I actually think that's a profoundly unhelpful way of working with people. Um, as a social worker, if you go to a family and you say, you've got problems, this is what you need to do to sort them out, you're very likely to get the doors. You probably won't get into that family again. It's not an effective way of working. Effective working in social work for me is about building relationships, realizing that in relationships both sets of people have got expertise and that through creating a dialogue we can make progress. And that's the underlying philosophy within exchange. So um, rather than trying to summarize research and give it to you, we want to create ongoing relationships and conversations that will improve our research and make it more practice focused, but also um, enrich your understanding of the research and ability to apply it across, um, across your organizations. Um, so, in practice, what does that mean? In practice, that means um, we're uh, launching a whole series of events, um, conferences, workshops. They will be done in, in different geographical settings across Wales to make it as accessible as possible to everybody. It's backed up by a website. This will all be launched in October. Um, it will be backed up by a website um, and other interactive materials to support the, the use and understanding of research, but also to improve the research we do. Um, I've got to make the key point again, it's free. Um, so all we ask people to do is come to the Cascade Exchange um, stand, sign up your organization, we'll send you further information, we'll send you the full uh, events that we're running this year. And I just want to sort of finish with a, with a little sort of almost an apology, um, which is when I came to Wales, I planned to do, actually it was that waterfall thing that Dennis mentioned earlier, I was going to spend a year or two really getting to know everyone, understanding the networks, understanding what's currently there, and then making a proposal for something a bit like this. And then um, I'm glad that the waterfall method isn't the right one, because what actually happened is a, a pot of money came along that allowed us to deliver this for free this year, 
but it wasn't going to happen again. So I'm not one to look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, we took the money. We're running it free for a year. We've already talked to partners in Swansea, Glyndwr, um, Bangor, and we hope to, to talk to others and to other partners. But what we want to do through the course of the year is really work with all of you to make Exchange a really vibrant network and community. Because one of the great things in Wales is it's, it's, it's not so big that we can't all know each other. And I think there's therefore a real opportunity to build a network that's going to create uh, a much better sense of what good practice is and a much better sort of sense of how research can make a difference. So I hope I haven't gone over my two or three minutes. Uh, my one final point is, because we're working with other universities, we thought it important that it was for both adults and children. So it's not, though Cascades uh, more around the children's area, we're working with other partners to make sure that it's across the whole of social services. Uh, so I hope you're able to come to our stand uh, and sign up. And did I mention that it's free? Yes, I, I think I did. And I hope I, I have a chance to get to know you all. I'm really looking forward to uh, the rest of my first day at school. Thank you very much. Uh, Donald, as he said, is the Professor of Child and Family Social Work at Cas Cascade Cardiff University. Is Donald? Sorry, I, I just checked you were there. Um, and Donald is going to speak about um, what is good social work practice. Is that right? Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for staying. I know how tempting at the end of a long conference, particularly if we've got a long journey afterwards, it is to not come. In fact, I was slightly tempted not to come myself, but I thought, as the keynote speaker, that's probably not acceptable behaviour. Um, those of you who were here yesterday morning may remember that I said it was a bit like my first day at school. Uh, and I have to report back, it's been a wonderful um, first and, and second day at school. I've really enjoyed the conference because it's been so interesting. People have been so warm and welcoming. Um, and I particularly enjoyed seeing so many directors of social services dancing at one time. I think next year I may, I, don't, I didn't think the Welsh social care world was ready for my dancing, but maybe next year I may unleash it. Um, so the, the, there's lots going on in Wales and it's a very exciting time to uh, be here and I think there's a lot of links between the things I'm going to be talking about um, and things that were mentioned in various other talks. Um, but the research I'm going to talk about was all, take, all took place in England, um, and uh, I, I guess I'll be interested to see whether, for you, some of it resonates with things that are happening um, here. Um, long experience teaches me that it's better to really cover one topic in, in depth uh, than lots uh, in less depth, and I'm ignoring my long experience and covering lots of topics. Um, that I'm currently researching in the hope that it will be a bit of a pick and mix and that you'll each, many of you will be able to find different things you find interesting uh, in, in it. Um, so, um, I'm really going to think about three key questions. What is good social work practice? It, it, this is in child and family social work, though I think really almost entirely the, the answers are the same really in different settings. Um, what difference does it make and what sort of outcomes are associated with good practice and less good practice? And then how can we create good practice? So um, I, um, I suppose my research is really about these three things. I, I'm very interested in the nature of good practice and I'm very struck by the fact that globally, in terms of published research, there's just very, very little about what, what social work practice is and almost nothing that then links that to outcomes for children and families. So I'm interested in those two areas, but I've increasingly been interested in then how do you shape good practice? What's the impact of training or supervision or organisational change? And those are the issues I'll be looking at uh, today in um, my talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about four studies. Uh, starting in the left-hand corner, uh, a fairly large randomised controlled trial of motivational interviewing, where we trained some people, half the workers in a local authority in motivational interviewing, and then randomised whether families got somebody who was trained in motivational interviewing or not. That led on to a second project, which is um, where we're using the feedback and the re we're still observing practice and doing research interviews, but we're feeding back the data about the quality of practice and the family's experiences, both to individual workers through coaching and, and I think this is probably the most innovative thing, we're producing a 
um, a progress review each quarter about the level of uh, practice skills and the views and experiences of families direct to social workers with the idea that often inspectors and others are looking at the wrong things. They're looking at the things that are easy to look at and we're trying to look at outcomes and, and quality of practice. Third study is local authority reform, uh, a whole agency, a whole children's services department changing so that it becomes more integrated with other um, agencies. And the final one is the rollout of something called the Hackney Model or systemic units. Um, so there's four studies, but I'm going, they, have, they, they actually have multiple sort of different strands, but they have one strand in common. And the one strand they have in common is they all collect data in roughly the same way. And that involves cases going for allocation. At the first or second interview, the social worker asks the family whether they're going to be involved in the study. If the family says yes, we come along, we observe the practice, we record the practice. Um, we then, again, if the family wants to, or the parents want to, we interview the parents and the children. Um, and then three months later, we go back and interview the family again to see what sort of outcomes there are at three months. Um, and so if you take all those different studies I talked about together, we're going to have uh, up to 500 recordings of direct practice with some evidence about um, engagement and outcomes at immediately afterwards and then three months later, which, um, well, I'm really excited about it because there isn't a data set like that anywhere in the world that actually looks at what social workers are doing and then relates it to outcomes. I don't think, unless you know one and want to come and tell me about it later. Um, but today I'm going to talk more about the RCT data because that was done a year earlier and I, I, I'm more immersed in the data and then I'm going to add some of the other data as we go along. So... Um, I guess the first question is, what is good for social work practice? What do you think it is? Um, I'm saying we, we need to explore what good practice is and link it to outcomes. But genuinely, in terms of research, I think in terms of researching what good practice is, it's a really hugely neglected area. And I guess I'd also say, is it something that over the years we've neglected to think about enough in leadership and practice? So, um, you know, is there a clear vision of good practice in your organisation? There clearly are some where well, that's definitely the case, but, but would you feel that you, um, you could say what great social work practice is in your organisation? Don't worry, this isn't going to be an interactive session. Um, I'm not going to get you to talk about it. But just have a think about whether you could answer that question, because I'm going to tell you something about what we developed as a way of beginning to think about what good practice is. Um, because if you want to relate practice skills to outcomes, you need to say, well, what, what is the key to good practice? Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'll come back to that point, really. Um, a lot of the studies have looked at motivational interviewing, which is a counselling approach, um, uh, where it's, it's, it's essentially... The key to motivational interviewing is this. Uh, it's the idea that it's up to individuals whether they want to change, and therefore their motivation is likely to be the difference between the life they're leading and the life they would like to lead. And it's helping them explore that gap to decide whether they want to make a change. Um, but for me, in some ways, that's just a, 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 it's an opportunity to, to start thinking about what is good practice and how do we change systems, services to create great practice. Um, but that, this is where I started to think about it, and it's therefore influenced uh, what, what we've looked at in relation to um, defining what good practice is. Uh, because we started with something called the, handily called the Motivational Interviewing Treatment Integrity Code, the MITE. Um, which codes for four elements of motivational interviewing practice. The first three are collaboration, uh, autonomy, which is the degree to which you're gi giving people, um, or emphasizing people's control over their own lives. Evocation, which is getting them to come up with their motivation rather than telling them what to do. Those three are averaged to create motivational interviewing skill. And then empathy, which is demonstrating an understanding of the other person's point of view and feelings. Uh, is not essentially part of MI, but it's very important. So those four are coded. They're used extensively in motivational interviewing research. I'm going to talk about those. But there's obviously more to social work practice than simply those. Put sort of very simplistically, you might say those are quite a good start for thinking about the caring elements of child and family social work. But what about the elements that are more about the use of authority and what good authority is? Through a complex process that I'm not going to go over now, um, we developed three additional dimensions of good practice that we looked at. Purposefulness, uh, clarity about concerns, and a focus on the child, which left us with seven things that we code. So when I'm talking about social work practice, uh, this is really our first attempt to think about indirect work skills, what are the, some of the key things, and we went for collaboration, autonomy, evocation, empathy, purposefulness, clarity about concerns, focus on the child. 
Having done that, I'd say this isn't all there is to it. There's, there's much more to it, but this is, this is where we're starting to look at the, the link between skills and outcomes. We code them on a five-point scale. Three is the starting point. Below, th below three is sort of less good practice. Above three is better level of practice. We obviously have detailed descriptions. This is just my unscientific sort of summary. So, we've looked at practice in lots of different places in some depth. What do you think we found? And I will ask these rhetorical questions because my guess is, what I find is when I just show people the findings, everyone goes, oh yeah, that's what I thought you'd find. Which always makes me think, well, that was a waste of a year of my life if everyone knew this. So I tend to find thinking, what do, have a think, what do you actually think we found? And then, I think it's just more exciting, I can say, and this is what we actually found. So, this is what we actually found. Um, so th this graph goes all the way to the top of the screen with the, the mid... I'm going to go away from here and just try sharing. So that point is the average. So basically what we're finding is for the MI skills and the, the more collaborative type skills and the empathy, on average social workers are often telling people what to do, not ter listening terribly much. There's obviously a variation. This is an average. But there's quite a lot of very directive and almost rather bureaucratic practice. But what about the the more authoritative or, or use of authority side of things. Here we actually find a similar sort of picture, that, that there wasn't loads of clarity about concerns or focus on the child either. Social workers were often spent a lot of time persuading people what to do, giving advice, telling people what to do. They varied, but many didn't spend a lot of time listening, and often the child was quite absent from the conversations, even when they were quite clear, child and family, social work child protection type issues. Um, so I'll move on. So that's what we found. This is before we did any types of interventions. Um, how do you think the skills were related to each other? So we had seven, some that you would say were more authority, some that you would say more caring. In any one given interview, if there was a high level of empathy, what would you expect the level of clarity of concerns or focus on the child to be or purposefulness? Again, have a think what the answer was. And now I'll reveal the answer. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through this table in great depth. The black things are correlations. And what we basically found is all the skills are correlated with one another. And I think the key thing here is many of the care skills were very closely related to each other. But things like empathy were strongly related to purposefulness and clarity about concerns. So we did not find that in social work it is an issue of we need to be tougher or softer or more caring or more controlling. The key thing is actually good social workers combine empathy and collaboration with being purposeful and clear about concerns and bringing the child into the conversation. There's not a contradiction between those things. I, I think that's a really important finding. I can't hear the, the whispers of excitement in the room, but I think they're in your, probably in your head, aren't they? Um, so... I, th I think that's crucial. We're, really, we're not talking about whether people are more, more one or the other. It's, it's more about how skilled workers can be. So now I'd like to unpack, and I think this is the first time I've really, um, really talked about a lot of these findings, certainly in, in any depth, uh, thinking about how do worker skills relate to, firstly, engagement of families and then outcomes for them. Because actually, I think in social work, we sloppily make lots of assumptions that if workers work in a certain way, it will produce certain things. And I'm just going to tell you, it turns out to be quite a complicated picture. Um, but the first thing is, what about engagement? We measured engagement in lots of ways, but the primary measure we use is something called the Working Alliance Inventory, which has been used a lot in counselling. Um, and it measures what people think of the relationship, the degree to which they've agreed about the goals for the work, and whether they're carrying out the tasks that are associated with those, those goals. So... How do you think the skills predict the level of engagement of parents shortly after the interview and then at three months? I'll give you a moment to think about what you think the answer is. Um, and also, which skills might be related? You know, are, are, they're positively related, but which are the ones that are particularly important in predicting uh, engagement? I've left that box empty to build up the sense of anticipation. How's it going? Is it, is, 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 is it getting exciting? Here are the results. Okay. What we found was that the more collaborative ones were strongly related to the engagement stuff. So the MI spirit, which is the summary of collaboration, autonomy, evocation, strongly linked to engagement. And remember, that's the MI spirit interview at T1. The first column means that there's really a very strong correlation with the degree of engagement at T2. Similarly for empathy. Purposefulness and child focus, actually, there's, there's a, 
there's a relationship there. It doesn't achieve statistical significance. It's not, and it's not as strong. I was surprised and interested that clarity of concerns and the ability to be clear about why you're involved with the family was also predictive of level of engagement with the service uh, at uh, both T1 and T2. So skills are related to engagement. Um, this, is, this, this presentation is a mix of good news, bad news. Maybe I should have said overall level of skills. Maybe that's bad news. It wasn't as good as I'd hoped. Uh, however, skills are related to engagement. Good news. You may be priming yourself for a bad news story coming around the corner. So um, anyway, um, having thought about skills and engagement, how would we think these related to outcomes at 20 weeks? But before we can answer that, how would you even think about measuring outcomes in children's services or in social services generally? Presumably an issue you've been thinking about a lot recently because uh, the Act talks about these things. What measures might we use? What measures do you use? What measures should we use? This is a very, very, very complicated issue that I spend a lot of time talking about and I'm going to try to summarise it, I think, in one slide. So we'll see how this goes. I'm going to summarise it by saying it's tricky, very, very, very tricky. Um, there's loads of issues that social workers deal with, from unborn babies where there's very serious risks through to 17-year-olds with problematic behaviour, through to families with social problems. I mean, you don't need me to tell you. How on earth could you measure outcomes across that range of difficulties? Uh, secondly, there's a more sort of theoretical one. Can we decide what the outcomes are, or do we need to negotiate them? And if we need to negotiate them, is that for every single case that needs to be negotiated? In which case, how on earth could you use the sort of research measures that we tend to use, which are standardised? So, you know, strength and difficulties questionnaire is for children's emotional and behavioural well-being. That's not a negotiable uh, one. Uh, thirdly, this is a, a really important one in terms of evaluation, and it's one I've learned through bitter experience. How sensitive is the measure to change? There's no point, well, it's often self-defeating to use measures that don't really change very much to measure outcomes because you falsely conclude you're not making a difference. But then, related to that, change isn't always necessarily the goal in social work. Often, I think, we're working just to stop things getting worse, or maybe even, <laughs> maybe even a little worse, is a good outcome in some cases. So how could we think about maintenance, um, and also about quality in its own right? I think it was Margaret who was talking about decency being crucially important. And actually, I think decency in the delivery of child protection in particular is, is, uh, is inherently an outcome in its own right. So these are tricky, tricky issues, and I do, not, <laughs> I do not have all the answers. If I did, I would be very, very famous. Um, maybe one day. Um, this is how we approached it. We use something called goal attainment scaling, uh, which I don't have time to go into in detail at the moment, but it, simplistically put, it is you sit down with the person, uh, they agree what the key goal is they want to work on, and then you get really detailed behavioural descriptors of what's happening now, what do you want to achieve, what needs to change between now, now and, uh, you know, what, what would, how would you know whether you've achieved these things? And that, when we go back in three months, allows us to say, was that goal achieved? Was it partially achieved? Was it not, did nothing change? Have things actually gone worse? Life rating on a 10-point scale is actually one of my favourite measures, even though it's not really validated. Rating of quality of the service, I think, is important in its own right, because it speaks to this issue of, of um, decency. And then we use a variety of standardised instruments. So where uh, parental stress or anxiety or depression is an issue, we use general health questionnaire, etc., etc. And then we use something kind of funky, if you're a statistician, called a Z-score. Uh, and what a Z-score is, is it measures, using standard deviation, it changes any score. So GHQ has 12 uh, questions, SDQ is at 36 or 40. Uh, because it looks at the variation in the sample, it converts everything to Z-scores and they can be compared one to the other. Should I just leave it at that? I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, so we use a variety of things, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about those yet because the numbers are not large enough to really draw conclusions. I'm going to talk mainly about the top three. But I really like goal attainment scaling. I think it's the, the good thing about it is it seems to have validity. It seems to relate to actually these other standardised instruments, but it's a negotiated outcome measure. So you're not imposing on people, this is what we're looking at. You're, you're having a discussion about it. So thinking about these, you may remember, I've given you a flash to the answer when I was going to say it. So, the reason I'm talking about outcome measures is how did engagement and skills link to outcomes at three months? Those of you who, who saw it very quickly will see that, that um, engagement was related to some issues about overall satisfaction with your social worker, but actually engagement wasn't linked to really any of the outcome measures that we could look at. Um, skills 
were very weakly related and generally didn't um, achieve significance, though empathy was related to how satisfied people were with their social worker. So, you know it's good news, bad news, good news. This is a bad, a bad news slide. In fact, potentially, it's a terrible news slide. How are we going to make sense of this if the skills of social workers make no difference or, very, or, or, or seem to have quite small relationships to any outcomes we want to talk about? Shall we all just um, give up and go home? Don't worry, we're not going to end on the bad, bad news slide. Because actually the picture is much more complicated and I think there's policy and practice implications of um, unpick, unpicking some of this. Um, I mean, the first thing is, while the relationships may be kind of weak and some of them don't achieve statistical significance on the first sample, though when we put the samples together and if they're there, they may well achieve it, um, they are nonetheless linking some skills to outcomes. And I think a question that's worth thinking about is, when we talk about evidence-based practice and evidence-based interventions, how strong actually are the links we're thinking about between one evidence-based intervention and any given outcome? Um, and actually, if you convert effect sizes to correlations, if you think about something like cognitive behaviour, behavioural therapy and depression, which is very strongly evidence-based, the correlations with outcomes are only between 0.2 and 0.3. So, in fact, the, the correlations between skills and outcomes are quite similar to those you would find in in claims for evidence-based medicine. Is this kind of making any sense to you? All I would say, you, you, don't worry if, if that, that, that wasn't your bag. The, the point to take home is, um, actually the impact we have, is, uh, the, the, that people have, is, is, is never 100%. It's always just changing some proportion of people. We're helping them to change. I think there are some issues about engagement and link to, links to outcomes, and perhaps we spend too much time talking about engagement, um, and we should spend more thinking about skills and outcomes. Um, but the crucial point is the bottom one. The link between skills and outcomes, and it took me a long time of staring at the data to really, and doing various analysis to realise this, the link between skills and outcomes is mediated by a key variable, which again, when I tell it to you, you will say, why did you spend a month? It's really obvious what this variable is. Yeah, it's obvious after I tell you, but before I tell you, what do you think the variable is, or the key thing that I need to look at is? No, you see... I bet you, you probably do know, but you're feeling a little bit embarrassed by being asked to shout out in public. The key variable is the amount of contact people actually have with their social worker. So when we looked at the whole sample in the randomised control trial, which was 610 families, and we looked at the ICS data set, how many contacts they actually had after allocation with their social worker, 4% had no contact at all. Um, 51% had one to three meetings, and, uh, you know, uh, 20 35% had four to nine meetings. The vast majority of people over the three months follow-up we had with them actually didn't see very much of their social worker because a very high proportion of, social, of the families that social, were being allocated to social workers in this local authority and actually in the others we've looked at, a very high proportion, there's a bit of a concern, a social worker becomes involved, they do one or two visits and the case gets closed. And in those cases, it's not really surprising that the skills of social workers don't really have much of a relationship to outcomes. So what happens when we look at eight or more visits, so that they've had quite a bit of contact with their social worker? What do you think the relationship between skills and outcomes is there? You may be getting used to my pattern of good news, bad news, good news. Last one was bad news. Good news, oh, but I could break the pattern at any moment, we'll see. Um, in fact, it is a good news story. The numbers are really small here. So it's done on the first sample we studied, and we're going to go and do it, and we'll have a larger sample once we've finished. The numbers are small, but the correlations are really quite high. So when we look at people, only people who had eight or more contacts with their social worker, we start to get some very strong relationships between the skills of social workers, and particularly purposefulness comes through, empathy is also very important. They start to have a strong relationship with just how people are rating their life now, and also some of the standardised instruments um, that we began to look at. So it is worth becoming really skilled at social work. It's really worth working on developing excellent services, I think. So I thought I might hear a cheer at that point, but no. Hey! You, you probably think, yeah, but it's a bad news one coming around the corner, and there, there probably is, uh, but anyway. There are some caveats. Uh, the quality of practice was tested in one interview, and we sort of then took that as a proxy for skill, and, and you know, the, 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 that could be problematic. Um, I think a key one that I'm really interested in is we're looking at direct practice here, but direct practice is only one part of good social work, and I've increasingly thought we need to look at social work assessment and decision-making and direct practice together. 
which re I think requires an adaptive methodology. Um, but I think that the general point, I, I suppose, I want to take from this before I, I start to think about how you create differences in practice is um, to think about um, how we think about the, the difference that social workers make. And the fact that what we found is actually in a, about half the cases that get allocated, social workers don't make any difference. And the main reason for that is there isn't really much of a reason for social workers to be involved. There's, certainly there's some sort of problem, but it's not a really significant problem. It kind of resolves itself or it turns out it wasn't such a big problem. Um, there's also other issues that, that we need to think about. And one of the big ones in terms of research is people do sort out their own problems. You know, they're not just actively waiting for social workers to help. So you, you get to see a lot of change anyway. Um, but nonetheless, overall, I think there's an encouraging picture here of generally there's a relationship between skills and outcomes, and it's particularly strong in the small sample of people who see their social worker quite a lot. The last person also um, had a picture of Einstein, and they had a quote. I have a picture of Einstein for probably more egotistical reasons. I said to my previous research team, jokingly, um, Einstein's very famous. I'd like to be famous. Einstein had a really famous equation, E equals MC squared. Maybe I should have an equation. Um, and my team took the mickey out of me. That's probably one of the reasons I had to leave and come to Cardiff. Um, to, not just about that, they took the mickey about lots of things. Um, so I tried to create a kind of equation that would help us think about what is the relationship between practice skills and, and outcomes in social work. An equation that's going to make me as famous as Einstein. <clears throat> And this is the equation. If P equals R, then O equals QI over S. I can see you're thinking, yes, yes, this is it. But you may be thinking what some of these letters stand for. The most important single one is this. If the problem is real, okay? And I think that's a key thing. That, that it really, it's only when... It's, it, it's, as with GPs, you wouldn't judge GPs. There was that, that example from yesterday about all the different sort of things that come in. You wouldn't judge GPs on how they do with people who are not actually sick. And it's the same with social work. You know, we have to be focusing on, on places where there's a real issue. Then outcomes equals, what do you reckon these letters stand for? Quality of practice times intensity. Anyone want to guess what S stands for? It's very technical. Stuff. Okay? It's possible that Einstein's reputation is safe. Um, I think the quality uh, and intensity is essentially the, the crucial thing here. But the stuff is lots of other things happens in people's lives, which from a research point of view and from a practice point of view makes it complicated. So that's sort of just jokingly to say it's not a simple relationship. Uh, lots of other things happen. But I think that th these are some key elements that I've learned from looking at practice. Uh, if the problem is real, then outcomes are related to the quality of practice and the intensity of the service received. So, um, having thought a bit about good practice, um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, relatively briefly um, about how we begin to think about changing practice and some of the things we've learned around that. So I'm going to start with some work we've done in Islington um, and compare what the quality of practice was in Islington without training. Then um, we, we did a, in the randomised control trial, we, and when I say we, I mean I, delivered four days of intensive training plus eight weeks of individual coaching to people to increase, increase their skills in motivational interviewing. And then after that, more recently, we've been feeding back direct observations of practice, both and providing coaching around their practice, both to workers and also to the system as a whole, so that managers and the service get to see what their skills are like. So in, in the tradition of when I show it to you, you'll think, oh, I knew what the answer was going to be. Before I show it to you, what do you think this showed about skills? Did they go up? Did they go down? Did they say the same? You don't have to shout out. Just have a little think in your mind. This is what we found. So we're looking at MI spirit, empathy, and purposefulness. And what we essentially found is that that process significantly increased the level of MI skill and empathy. And it, it slightly increased the level of purposefulness, which is important that we, it didn't reduce. Focusing on person-centered, strength-based approaches doesn't change the focus on the child, actually. So I'm left sort of wondering whether this is half empty or half full, as I often am in research, there's definitely a shift towards better practice. Skilled, social, skilled MI practice is said to happen at 3.5, so we're still not achieving that. Uh, so it's kind of encouraging, but we've still got quite a long way to go in terms of creating change. 
The second thing is beginning to think we've now got data from seven local authorities, um, and I want to compare some of them now just to think, because one of the things that's become very obvious is there are very significant differences in the way social workers practice with families between local authorities. And I have to say, in England, they are completely unrelated to offset inspections or other external measures of um, quality. So we've been involved in local authorities that have been considered inadequate, those that have been considered good. There is literally no correlation between that and the service experienced by families in our experience. So th these are the variations we saw. I don't know if I can answer that question, but anyway. Um, there's probably too much data here. Um, so I'm just going to pick out a couple of things. The very large level of um, MI spirit on the left is actually probably based on a very small, it's based on a very small number, so I think we should probably ignore that. Um, I guess there's a couple of things to point out here. Across the local authorities, again, we're not seeing anyone who's really averaging over uh, into the threes and fours. Um, so the overall level of practice is still tends to be quite procedural and authoritarian, but there's very significant differences. Empathy in particular varies a lot between different authorities. With local authority five, the average is 1.97. To get an average of 1.97 means that a lot of your sample is one, okay? Because you can't have halves on that. Um, so about 40% of the social workers in that local authority, and in that local authority we did 75 observations, um, a lot of the social workers, we couldn't find any sign of empathy whatsoever when they were talking to families. Now we're unpicking why this is and some of the key factors but I have to say, um, there are two things that are particularly important um, that it, we'll pick out, pick out in the qualitative interviews. One is whether there is a vision for good practice, a sense of a model that they want to deliver. And the second is the style of management. Um, the more directive the senior managers are about telling social workers what to do, the less empathic the social workers are because they then go out and tell the, p the parents what to do. So we feel there's a real link qualitatively between the way management happens in an authority and the way social workers practice with families. And that's important because, as we saw, there is a link between outcomes and the way, the way families are talked to. And I think it's a real challenge there for us, well, to put it mildly. Okay. Um, I say developing a theory about how to support excellent practice. This isn't, it isn't, this isn't nearly sophisticated enough to be a theory. This is just some... Uh, some squares and words that I'm going to put onto the screen very quickly. And I'm going to go over it quite quickly because um, while I'm still well within my time, I know I started late and I'm sure that you want me to go as quickly as possible. Um, so here's some key... So I think Albert said I could have as much time as I wanted, isn't that right? <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Um, so a key is having a vision of practice excellence. And a vision has to be actually sufficient that... Uh, I think the key thing about a vision is it needs to do two things. It needs to inspire people in the organisation, but it needs to have a level of specificity that if you're working with a particular family, you can actually say this, this is or isn't you know, part of our vision. There's then a bunch of things in the middle that are the things that, make the vision, that translate the vision into practice. So we, we sometimes use the the phrase that someone else coined, that culture eats strategy for breakfast, culture eats training for breakfast. What do you actually mean when you say culture? I think we need to break that down into different elements. And these are some of the things we're currently researching. Uh, training has some impact. Supervision and the way it's carried out seems to have a much bigger impact. Selection of good social workers is quite important. Uh, the nature of the meetings, particularly the decision-making meetings, is very important. And the values qualitatively seems to also have an impact. The next thing is you then need an effective initial assessment service. And I suppose having done this now in seven local authorities, in fact more than that really, um, the, the number one thing before you get into any of the higher blown things about visions of excellent practice, etc., is having a front door that is effective at rooting out as quickly as possible cases that shouldn't really have social work involvement in them. And there's two reasons for doing that. Obviously from our point of view it frees up resources, but there's a much more important um, much more important thing, which is we tend to think of social work involvement as a good thing, and we often say, well, we could prevent it with more uh, early intervention. Some of these families, they don't want people to come around their houses and talk about their difficulties or, or, or have these difficult conversations, and for many, it's actually traumatising to have that sort of investigation. So the less we do it, the better for everyone. It, it saves us time and resources, and it, it reduces our negative impact within the community. And it allows us to then focus on the really difficult work and the cases where the skills of social workers make a huge difference, um, as my research suggests uh, it does. 
And then it's all about quality of practice and outcomes. But these are the things I think that tend to be missing. These are the areas more than any that I think we need to be working on, which is not just saying we've got good practice, but actually having uh, approaches to feeding, to, to knowing what the quality of practice is and the outcomes are within your authority or your service and being able to feed them back so that we can develop practice better. So, a few concluding points in my last two slides. I think often we talk about evidence-based practice and things as if it was down to individual workers, but practice is not produced by individual workers being skilled or trained. It's produced by organisations that, that, that set out to produce particular types of practice. Um, I therefore think local authorities need to think about what is your vision of excellent practice and then how do we actually create that vision? What are the sites through which we produce the culture in our organisation? Um, I have to say, I, you know, I, I don't really have any answers. Uh, I, I, and I, I'm going to say, I, I, in some ways, I don't think having the answers is necessarily where we need to be now. What I think is really important is that we start really focusing on the right questions. Um, and then we'll develop partial answers and better understanding. So I suppose this is a bit like um, Einstein's thing about we really need to understand the nature of the problems and the issues we're looking at. And so I'd come back to where I started this presentation and say the right, uh, the right questions for me to be asking in my research, the right questions I think for you to be asking in your different roles within organisations are what is great social work? Really, what, what, what specifically is it? How do I understand it? What difference does it make and what evidence can we have for that? And then crucially, the one we haven't spent nearly long enough thinking about in terms of research and I think professionally as, as a profession, how can we make that happen? And my belief is if we really focus on these types of questions, then we will begin to make real progress. Because I, get, I showed you a correlation of 0.6, I think, between purposeful, um, purposefulness and uh, family life rating. Numbers only go so far. That 0.6 was families' lives that had been completely transformed by great social workers who were able to build an understanding and a collaboration with them in very difficult circumstances, talk about difficult issues, and then go beyond talking to actually create plans that made a difference in children's and families' lives. And for me, if we start thinking about these questions, then we're much more likely to create that type of transformative practice uh, that I think is what social work is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you.